and uh, you have a set of beautiful part participants here waiting to hear you. And we also have Amrati here, Dr. Ananda's uh, mother, who's sitting right here. Can you see her? Oh yes, most uh, most perfect greetings to Amrati. <laughs> yes. So uh, you can go on. The next 20 minutes is all yours, so Amrati. I wish I had the opportunity to be there in person, actually, to see you all. But uh, I'm also grateful for the blessings of technology that allow us to meet in this way. I wanted to, uh, this afternoon, to uh, give an overview of the, the whole subject of yoga and psychotherapy. My Guru Dave published a book on the subject in the late 1970s which has been very much in need of updating from a scientific perspective um, based on the enormous um, advances that have happened in neuroscience since that time. But let me first begin by just noting the similarity in the therapeutic purpose of Sankhya Yoga and also psychotherapy. Um, as we all know, the Sankhya metaphysics are the philosophical framework within which yoga operates. And both the therapeutic enterprise in the scientific sense and Sankhya have the goal of the alleviation of suffer suffering. In psychotherapy, the goal is symptom resolution or the alleviation of a disorder. In yoga, the goal goes quite a bit further than this in terms of the total alleviation of, of all suffering. Uh, and its cause in ignorance and, of course, the liberation of the person. So yoga goes well beyond the therapeutic enterprise as it's, um, as it's understood from a scientific perspective. So with that in mind, uh, and I think it's always important to keep that in mind because it's very easy to slip off into uh, science simply appropriating yoga um, and sort of making it its own property. And this is the, the caution that Swami Veda always felt about the whole field of yoga therapy. Um, he, would, he went in front of the Saitara Convention uh, 11 years ago, and in his two keynote addresses that he gave to that body, uh, the first thing he really said was, yoga is not for therapy, yoga is for liberation, and therapy is a side effect. And so long as we keep that in mind, I think that's uh, a wonderful enterprise for us all to be engaged in. Um, let me begin by just uh, taking a sort of historical perspective and talking a little bit about um, the first uses of uh, yoga in, in psychotherapy, which really was uh, had to do with the early work of uh, Herbert Benson at Harvard's Mind Body Institute in terms of his explanation of the relaxation response. Um, when I applied for my certification, or not certification, when I, I applied for my registration in the Yoga Alliance, I told them that I have used yoga with every psychotherapy client during my entire career, and this is really where it began, because every client that I worked with would learn diaphragmatic breathing, a basic relaxation practice, usually the Nani Shodhana Pranayama, and very often other parts as well. But the relaxation is really the important part. Um, from the perspective of using relaxation in therapy, again, very often the goal is simply learning to relax your way out of an anxiety disorder, um, whereas the goal of relaxation in yoga is to remain entirely relaxed 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So, it's important to keep in mind that this is really a, an important lifestyle change. This early work of Benson's was very much um, added to by the work of the Mind and Life Institute, founded by the Dalai Lama and the neuroscientist Francisco Varela in the 1980s. And this began the process of science seriously looking into the role of mindful awareness in processes of human behavior change. And this was a very important part of building the bridge between 
between yoga and psychotherapy. Because, of course, awareness is what makes every practice in yoga work. Without the awareness, there's no yoga. Um, and so our task for most of us in our first years or decades in the process of practicing yoga is really to cultivate a very deep sense of mindful awareness that stays with us all the time and gradually changes our entire perception of, um, of our life and the context in which we live. Um, the interesting thing about mindful awareness is that when you are paying conscious attention, you stimulate the executive centers in the brain, the middle prefrontal cortex and associated structures that work on the whole task of integrating the entire central nervous system. So during the time that you are intentionally aware, your nervous system is constantly being reshaped and reprogrammed. This works pretty much in opposition with what we have come to call the default mode network, the whole system of structures in the brain and nervous system that basically contain the conditioning of the human mind, contain, contains all of our habits, for example. So the default mode network, which is in operation whenever we're not paying conscious attention, is basically your mind on autopilot, your mind running on the basis of its habit, which is how most people live their lives. And the important discovery here is that whenever you pay conscious attention, the default mode network goes into the background and goes dark. And the attention systems in the brain begin to reprogram that structure. And so this mindful awareness is a really key part of the whole process of reorganizing the nervous system in processes of human change, whether we're talking about the habits that we're trying to change in our yoga practice or the work that we're trying to do in psychotherapy. One of the things that goes along with mindful awareness is a subtle sense of joyfulness. And this is actually a very important part of both the practice of yoga and the practice of psychotherapy. Because the more a person becomes habituated to maintaining that mindful awareness, the more joyful your mind becomes as a steady state proposition. Um, and this is what the Dalai Lama means when he refers to having a happy mind. Now, so often we think of human happiness in terms of pleasure. We tend to confuse pleasure and joy, which I have found increasingly important to keep separate. The reason is that our bondage in samsara is basically accomplished through our attachment to Pleasure, which is the satisfaction of our desires, our basic desires, what my guru called the four primitive founts, food, sleep, sex, and self-preservation. These are the things that bind us into embodied life. And working in opposition to that habit of simply fulfilling our, um, our desires and experiencing pleasure is the process of mindfulness, which results in joy and the the reason that joy is different from pleasure is that it has no desire involved in it. It is simply celebration. It's the emotion that we have when we grow. When a two-year-old child takes its first step, everybody in the room, the child, the parents, everybody goes, ah, you know? um, And you feel this joy whenever you grow in any way. And, and the pursuit of that joy is really what drives all human behavior. At its root, if you think carefully about it, it even drives our desires. And so this is, in a way, the transcendental fountain. Um, the fountain of human growth and development at every level, physically, mentally, and spiritually. And so the more you condition your mind to remain aware the more joyful you become and the happier your mind becomes as a baseline proposition. And for clients who are experiencing, for example, depression, this is an extremely important and very simple practice to teach them. Just the practice of simple breath awareness makes a great difference 
to people who are depressed. I've had this experience often with people who could really do nothing else but just pay attention to their breathing. And certainly within the, the space of the therapy session, and also when I gave them this experiment to use at home, people have always experienced a change in their mood as a result. And just the fact that they can feel that change in their mood, however subtle, gives them a sense of hope about being able to change uh, more about what's going on in their mind and emotions. And so this aspect of pursuing the joy that comes with mindfulness is such an important part of both the work of psychotherapy and the practice of yoga. Um, and you know, we spent some time talking about its impact on the practice of yoga when I was when I was there previously, so I don't think I need to go into that part at this point, especially given our limitations of time. Let me take a few minutes to talk a little bit about some of the different forms of psychotherapy and how um, this aspect of uh, how yoga therapy can be um, combined with them. And the first, and I think to many of us trained in psychology, most obvious area is in the area of cognitive psychotherapy. Um, and the, the application of mindfulness here makes a huge difference to people in many different ways. I think the first thing is just the ability to observe emotions and thoughts as they arise. So many people, out of their habitual living in the default mode network, assume that they are their thoughts and emotions. This is a very common belief in, in many cultures across the world. And just learning that that is not the case is very often a real revelation to people. When you begin to pay attention and, and to have that mindful awareness of your breath, you immediately establish a kind of more objective distance in relationship to the flow of your thoughts and feelings. You can see them arising rather than just acting them out, as we often do when we're living habitually, we have a choice about how to respond. And this choice, the yogis tell us, is exactly what makes us human beings. It's what is also responsible for our ability to accumulate karmas and scars. And so this uh, process of mindfulness in cognitive psychotherapy greatly strengthens clients' abilities to make this kind of observation of themselves and makes the cognitive psychotherapy so much more effective. In the older forms of cognitive therapy, where the task was to try to get a sense of what beliefs were behind emotions and behavior, and then changing those beliefs, it works very nicely. In the newer forms of cognitive psychotherapy that come particularly out of work in Great Britain, the simple observation of that flow of thoughts and feelings is enough to create change. And in, in those schools of mindful cognitive change themselves in the process. Are we having some trouble with our connection? Okay, I'll continue. Yeah, yeah. Um, part of the reason for this has to do with the fact that mindful self-observation happens from buddhi. And the buddhi, we know from yoga, is the clearest and purest and most subtle layer of our mind field. In the Sankhya metaphysics, you may remember that buddhi and mahat are actually the cause of all of the lower constituents of our mental life. So because you are observing your life from that causal level, which is beyond even the formation of ego, when you are observing the flow of thoughts and feelings, your self-identification with those thoughts and feelings is automatically relaxed and loosened, if not completely separate and broken. So your, your attachment to the sanskara is broken by simply observing it to speak in yoga language. In terms of psychotherapeutic language, that process of observation allows 
the, the dysfunctional belief system to be automatically reprogrammed by the executive centers in your brain, and particularly by the prefrontal, prefrontal, middle prefrontal cortex. So this is a very powerful tool in doing cognitive psychotherapy for people, and it's extremely useful. Another subset of uh, these skills in cognitive therapy is the dialectical behavioral therapy of Francine Shapiro. And this uh, set of skills is really a way to teach people coping skills who have very, very severe mental health disturbances, borderline personality disorder, psychotic disorder, psycho, um, uh, schizoaffective disorder, these kinds of, of problems. And it teaches people basic skills, again, of relaxation, of self-management, of being able to calm the body down when it's activated by what's going on in the person's mind and emotions. Um, another area where this kind of mindful observation has made an enormous impact is the trauma-sensitive yoga therapy, which has been developed theoretically by David Epstein and his collaborators at Bessel van der Kolk's Trauma Clinic in Massachusetts. In their books on trauma-sensitive yoga therapy, they argue that they're describing a form of the practice of hatha yoga that is a special application of hatha yoga. In truth, I think what they're actually describing is how hatha yoga ought to be done in every case. In other words, slowly, mindfully, um, and with, uh, with positive mindful awareness. The one place where I disagreed with their way of doing therapy, at least in the first iteration of their theory, was that they had a rule that because the people we work with are traumatized, we will not touch the clients at any point for any reason in order to avoid triggering any traumatic flashbacks that might occur. Now, the issue that I have with this is that if you look at the different sensory modalities, touch is really the sensory modality that drives human development pretty much across the board infancy to old age. For example, if an infant is not picked up and held, it will fail to thrive and will die. This happened to enormous numbers of infants at the end of the Second World War in uh, orphanages in some of the Eastern European countries where there was not enough staff to touch the babies every day, and the babies that didn't get touched died. So I think this aspect of being able to use touch with our clients, even when we're working on dealing trauma, is, is very important in terms of helping, their, helping the developmental process to support their recovery from therapy. It does require, of course, a lot of sensitivity about how you touch people, about the, the attitudes in your mind and emotions when you touch people. Because when you touch someone, your mental state is transmitted to them. This is uh, the, the great Kashmiri yogi, Abhinav Gupta, made the point that the only, the only sense that is not withdrawn in the state of samadhi is touch, because touch is the vehicle of transmission of shakti. And the same thing is true of ordinary growth and development. So our mental state is transmitted by the way that we touch so if you, if you do touch a client for some reason, for example, in providing an adjustment in helping them to do some therapeutic bhakti yoga, you need to touch them on the exhaling phase of your breath when your system is relaxing so that you transmit relaxation to them. Of course, if there are disturbing emotions in your mind and heart at that moment, you probably wouldn't want to touch me for that reason because you don't want to add to their disturbance. So these are just a few examples of, of the uh, considerations there in terms of using touch in either psychotherapy or in teaching yoga or performing yoga therapy. Um, my colleague Ashutosh Sharma and I did an article about this in the um, International Journal of Yoga Therapy in, I believe, about 2013. Um, and so you can certainly look at that article for some more detail 
guidelines about the use of touch in psychotherapy and in yoga therapy. So this trauma, trauma-sensitive yoga therapy is actually proving to be extremely effective in, um, in healing trauma with people. And it's actually outdoing many of the other therapeutic modalities. Um, and I think at this point, probably on the basis of research, could be considered as therapy of choice. I once had a conversation with Bessel van der Kolk, the great psychiatric researcher on trauma, about whether he thought, for example, Nadi Shodhana Pranayama, because of its alternating stimulation of cerebral hemispheres, would be good therapy for traumatized people. And he said it would, and he added that these days, when people come to me for referrals to therapists, I don't refer them to therapists, I refer them to yoga teachers. Because he made the point that, and this is the subject of his latest book, if you're dealing with trauma, you have to include the body in therapy. And this is something that psychotherapy has been very slow to come to. But it finally is really happening in the field of trauma in many different ways of working with trauma. One of the most effective of which is using the yoga. Gestalt therapy, just because of its focus on increasing people's awareness, increasing awareness of their, you know, what's there in the contents of their mind and their sense of themselves, is obviously helped by the whole um, process of maintaining mindful awareness. I don't think I need to go into much detail with that. I'd like to come to the end of my discussion by talking a little bit about some of the changes in neuroscientific investigation that support the use of therapy, in, you know, of yoga and psychotherapy. And one of these, the most important one, I think, is recent um, surrender, I guess you'd say, of the old biologically deterministic idea that the brain is what organizes the mind. For so many years, neuroscientists were saying, that the mind was simply the re coincidental result of a lot of neurotransmitter reactions and electrical activity in the brain. And that attitude has really shifted at this point, largely because of the work of the Mind and Life Institute. And neuroscience is now willing to accept at a more mature stage of its development that it actually is mind that organizes the brain and nervous system. One of the methodologies that's used in neuroscientific research these days, which I think is enormously powerful, is the, the um, uh, neurophenomenology of Francisco Varela. Varela was a really interesting character and very much a meditation practitioner. And his idea was that we don't need to just make physiological measurements of people in order to learn about what's going on in the brain and nervous system. Um, we need to add to that data from the subjective experience of the subjects. And he would do this by doing exhaustive interviews with subjects about what was going on during the process of the experiment. So they end up having a much richer uh, con context within which to interpret the physiological data that they get. As a result, it's easier to look at processes in the brain and nervous system with a much finer resolution that you could do in ordinarily purely physiological research. In a recent article in 2017, uh, one of uh, Varela's students distinguished between what he called ordinary neurophenomenology, which is the methodology in all of the experiments that have been done so far, and what Varela called radical neurophenomenology. In this radical neurophenomenology, rather than just try to know the content of the subject's mind and heart during the experiment, and actually try to go further in the process of observation to try to observe what's going on in the mind at the moment just before the split between subject and object occurs in a person's mind. Now, as I was reading this article, I realized this is really taking mental self-observation back into the domain of the deep processes of meditation and yoga. Because the whole process of mantra japa does precisely the same thing. It goes 
from understanding the mantra as, as a set of syllables to just a feeling, to just an impulse in the mind, eventually resolving it into a, a single point, bindu. And at that point, which is the point where this emergence of a thought coming out of the spanda in the superconscious begins to divide into subjective and objective parts. And so the, this was an interesting example of neuroscience describing a meditative process in scientific language. And I think this gives us a way to begin to, to really include genuine yogis as a different kind and class of scientific observer. Our ordinary scientific observation deals with data from the senses. And this really, in Indian philosophical terms, is the domain of Nyaya and Vaisheshika. If you add the observation of the mind by the mind, then we get into the domain of Sankhya and Yoga. And this is the extra piece that the yogis can offer. Because a genuine yogi, with a, and by yogi here, I mean someone who re remains in a state of samadhi, as Vyasa says in the first sentence of his commentary on Patanjali, Yoga Samadhi. So a person whose mind field is that much clarified, purified, is able to observe the mind with the mind with an absolute precision that is totally free of any subjective distortion, because that subjective distortion comes from the emotional conflicts in the mind. So this ability of yogis to observe with this very fine discrimination, and my teacher Swami Veda, about observing the passage of time in some of his meditations to a resolution of 10 to the minus 57 of a second. This is orders of magnitude more precise than an atomic clock. What he was telling us is that your mind can do this if you simply go to that depth of meditation. And if, if we can find one of these genuine yogis who is willing to participate in scientific enterprise, that mind has the possibility to guide the further development of neuroscience in a way that will greatly increase its efficiency and the breadth of its knowledge. And so these days, when I'm going to neuroscience conferences, I don't put on a suit and tie. I come in my kurta pajama. And I stay, I make it very clear that I stay on the yoga side of the line, because I'm not beholden to any institution or any funders that might be offended by saying exactly what I need to say. And so my effort in my involvement with neuroscience here is to really try to persuade the field as much as possible to accept what yoga has to offer in terms of advancing our knowledge of the pure science in neuroscience, but also its application in the process of psychotherapy and, and also in yoga therapy. So I think that's a pretty good overview, and I think my time is just about up. So. Exactly on time. Oh, good. Like on time. So uh, I just check with them if they want to ask something to you. Just wait, hold on, one more minute. Uh, anybody wants to ask anything from what he said or what you want to ask, any doubts, any clarifications? Sorry, sir?
um, has really been, in his own work, both therapeutic and yogic, has been investigating these tapping therapies. Um, and they, they appear to have a really important impact in helping to shift people's cognition. So I think that that does have a lot of potential and is something that really is, uh, I think it's a really good idea to figure out a way to investigate this further. That makes a lot of sense to me.
thank you very much, and I'm, I'm, I want to add that uh, I have been touched by your book. <laughs> Okay, fine. I think he's coming. 